Hey everyone, my name is Obina, your Africa Explainer. So in my last video, I touched on the fact that Congo is one of the largest producers of cobalt in the world. But this may not necessarily be a good thing. Today we're going to get into that. But before we go and talk about Congo, let's talk about cobalt and why it is so important. It really just comes down to batteries, specifically electric car batteries. Now electric car batteries work a bit different to normal car batteries and that's made up of different materials such as lithium, manganese, favorite word to say by the way, manganese, nickel and of course cobalt. Now if that is as technical as you want to get I would skip ahead in this video because me and you are about to have some chemistry. <laughs> Okay, anyway, chemistry! Cobalt is a very versatile metal. In the past, it was used for things like dyeing glass and making ceramics. But in more recent times, it's been used in things like jet engine turbines and lithium ion batteries, which is what we're talking about today. These batteries can be found in things like smartphones, laptops, and of course, electric vehicles. And the effectiveness of cobalt comes down to four main factors. First of all, high energy density, meaning it can handle lots of energy compared to the amount of it that is used. It has a longer lifespan. It has high thermal stability, meaning it's heat resistant, which allows it to work efficiently even under high pressure and high temperatures. And with that, it is also a very safe metal to use. It is because of all these reasons that cobalt is such an essential part of lithium ion batteries, giving them the range and capacity to go on them road trips, basically. <laughs> In the burger that is driving life, cobalt is that cooker needed to heat up the meats. <laughs> or veggie patty or whatever you like inside of your burger. I like beef. Now you may be wondering, okay, so what's the big deal? As you said in your explanation, smartphones, laptops, them, what's wrong with it being used? Well, the issue is less about the fact that it is used. It's more about how much is used and where it's sourced from. Now let's answer that first question, how much is used? The answer between eight to 12 kilograms. Just to put that in some context, that is around the size of a medium French Bulldog. Personally, I'm not a fan of dogs. They have teeth sharper than mine. They have biceps. And if we go into a scrap, no matter the outcome, I would get in trouble. So mm, complex relationship, but bear with me. It works for this analogy. Electric cars typically have two batteries, one for handling the actual electronics of a car and the other for powering the engine, which is what we're talking about today. Each battery needs eight to 12 kilograms of cobalt. And as of July, 2023, there are approximately 840,000 electric cars on the road and a further 520,000 hybrid vehicles, which also use those batteries. So in total, quick maths, you're looking at 1.36 million batteries out there, aka 1.36 million French Bulldogs. Now can you imagine that for a minute? 1.36 million French Bulldogs up in your yard. That would be mad. You're like, it's like a skyscraper of French Bulldogs. I'd be crying. I wouldn't be comfortable. Hmm. But that's just talking about the UK. That's not including other European countries or even the US or other countries in the world that are all pushing for electric vehicles. This number is gonna grow exponentially. So that answers that first question of how many or how much. Answer, a lot of batteries. And with many governments pushing and incentivizing the purchase of electric vehicles, over time, this number is just gonna continue to grow and grow and grow especially as electric cars get cheaper and i'm not gonna lie my first car was a 2010 silver toyota prius so i'm part of the problem let's be honest so the next question where do we get all these french bulldogs cobalt from well as with a lot of things we go back to the motherland specifically 
the DRC. Now you may have heard of the DRC about its rainforest, about its wars, about the men, about the wars, all that song. <laughs> But in this case, we're talking about it because almost 70% of the world's cobalt comes from Congo DRC. If we were voting, they would be the majority. So they are big players in the game when it comes to cobalt. But this is where things get a bit dicey because they may not actually be the players. They may be pawns in another person's game. Let's get into it. As usual, when it comes to many issues on the continent, including mining in Congo, it is not a modern problem. It's been there for time and it has a very long history. If you're very interested in the intricacies of this and want to learn more, you can look down below in the description. There are some articles and papers for you to talk look about like the economic impact and the stretched on history if you're very interested in it. Here we're gonna do a bit more of a snapshot. Records show that the first large deposits of cobalt were found in 1914 by the Belgian company called Union Minire um, in the southern portion of what was then called the Belgian Congo Free State. Now you need to remember this is 1914, so DRC did not exist back then. It got its independence in the 1960s, so this is back in a time when man like Leopold was going around being like, yo, drawing a line here, this is mine, I have dibs, don't touch. In today's DRC, we are talking about uh, the region of uh, Lualaba, Huat Takatanga, and Huat Lomami provinces of the DRC. There should be a map here. Boom. And by 1926, Remember, the first deposits were found in 1914. Mining actually started in 1924, but by 1926, Congo and that company were the world's largest producers of cobalt at the time. In 1960, Congo gained its independence, which was awesome, but it was immediately followed by a series of military coups and civil wars. All of these were called the Congo Crisis. This was a major issue. Over 100,000 people were, were killed within these conflicts and these did affect the neighboring countries as, as well. So yeah, it was a big thing. But it wasn't done in isolation. The US and Belgium backed a man by the name of Mobutu with the hope that he would help block the Soviet movement in Africa at that time and of course, maintain the DRC as a key supplier of materials to the West. The Soviet Union backed their opposing side, so a lot of hands were actually within this conflict. Naturally, Mobutu won, A. But to everyone's shock, this guy said, we're not playing chess, we're actually playing Uno and pulled out an Uno reverse card. And instead of playing with these Western powers, went on to nationalize the foreign firms, forcing out European investors and handing over the management of these assets including the cobalt mining operations to his relatives and his friends. Straight, non-apologetic nepotism. Now this topic, as you can see, gets really deep. So I really encourage you in your own time to go ahead and read about it. I'm giving a quick snapshot here. With the drop of European investors, there was a gap. And naturally, China jumped in to fill it. As you can literally see, we, we could dig very deep into this whole mining thing in the DRC. It goes very far, but the main point of what I'm trying to say is here. In between the military coups, ineffective management, the lack of trust and consistent investment in the mining industry in Congo, the whole thing, the whole industry became very, very difficult to regulate. Which takes us to the crux of why the cobalt mining industry is such a deep and complex issue it touches various things and nobody is holding it together it's literally a free-for-all now when i say free-for-all it may sound a bit outlandish but it's literally that because this gave rise to the artisanal miners artisanal miners are people who are not officially employed by companies but work independently to mine minerals using their own resources and when i say their own resources i mean literally their hands. It is estimated that these miners produce 20% of the DRC's cobalt output and the rest of it coming from China then. And literally anyone can do this. So people moved into this area from all over the country to get their fill of their version of the gold rush. 
And when I say anyone, I mean anyone. Anyone from around the country, regardless of your age, religion, whatever. So this means both adults and children were part of the mining of this area. It's estimated that 40,000 of over 200,000 miners were children as young as six. And with the lack of regulation and control of these miners, people were literally digging all over the place in the hope of striking gold. This of course made ground very weak and susceptible to things like cave-ins. And one thing you need to remember is that this is where people actually lived as well. So when the miners came in, they forced out people who were trying to live in the area because it was inhospitable anymore. It wasn't a safe place to live. You're living around fumes and weak ground and cavens and all that. You can't live around that. So it displaced a number of people as these holes and craters of cobalt mining increased over time. Hopefully you're getting the picture. <laughs> it's not the most amenable conditions to live in or work under and no one is protecting anyone because once again these are essentially freelancers coming in to make their to make their buck and the thing is you can't really blame them for it within this area people are living on less than two dollars a day and on a good week you can make two hundred dollars so that's their hustle that's their uber that's their gold rush. That's that's their opportunity. You can't blame them for reaching for it. It's an unstable situation born from a lack of stability in its foundation in itself, which is why I gave that context. It is not a modern day issue. This issue spreads over 100 years and we're still experiencing the repercussions of it today. I always feel a bit conflicted when talking about issues of sustainability um, in the context of Africa because as much as there is this narrative of saving the world it's like you're building this future for our children at the cost of someone else's children it, <laughs> there's always a hidden cost to these actions as much as as one wants to talk about saving the world and, and trying to protect the environment we are saying that the environment using electric vehicles we're talking about saving the environment using these electric vehicles while at the same time building these craters in the homes of people in the DRC and messing up the environment of other families. You know, we're, we're claiming thought leadership and forward thinking, forgetting that it was sort of the sins of people's past that created the problem that we're in in, in the first place. I don't know. Part of me also feels like maybe it's just a phase. Maybe the DRC is literally going through their version of America's gold rush and this is just something that needs to happen that would lead to some future development and no lie there are conversations about um, how one can reduce the use of cobalt or use other materials for electric vehicles instead it's a long conversation though and who knows what lives will be lost in between that resolution and, and whatever we come up with and to be fair this is not just a conversation about you know western powers and what they're doing like i said mobutu was part of this as well, right? So this is also talking about African leadership and what we're doing within the space. Um, DRC has been in a number of conflicts over time. I just touched on the Congo crisis, but there are many other things as well. Again, I really encourage you to read up on it. Um, and and the gap that China filled, were China part to blame as well? Were they a villain or were they just taking advantage? There's a lot of different things that kind of go into this conversation. I think. I think the question we are left in with at the end is how do we go about building this sustainable future without reopening the scars of the past? If you have an answer to that or any thoughts, questions, opinions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Please like and subscribe as always. This has been Obina, your Africa explainer. Thank you for listening. Take care. Peace.